From the creators of Dark comes 1899, or as I like to call it, the amount of times I went, What the hell is going on? In this video, we'll be taking a look at some of the show's biggest mysteries, where it might be heading in season two, and of course, all its nods to Titanic. I've left timestamps below so you can see all the topics we'll be covering. Without further ado, let's get into it. Oh, and uh, like and subscribe. The year is 1899, at least that's what we think it is. Maura Franklin is aboard the Kerberos, a newly refurbished ship headed to North America along with over 2,000 passenger and crew. We immediately learn of her missing sister ship Prometheus, which vanished over four months ago. Prometheus, not only the name of a Ridley Scott film, was a titan from Greek mythology who defied the gods by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge, and civilization. As punishment for this crime, Zeus had an eagle eat Prometheus's liver. He'd then regrow it and have the eagle eat it again and again in an endless loop, similar to how the passengers engage in their own endless loop. Even weirder is that the Greeks believed the liver to be the seat of human emotions, and human emotions are what Henry Singleton believes to be the thing that keeps them in their loop. And every time they die, because they can't get rid of their emotions. The second ship is Kerberos, or more commonly known as Cerberus, the multi-headed dog in Greek mythology that guards the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. Our Kerberos works in a similar way, preventing our dead from leaving and sticking them in an endless loop. We're told that these two ships, along with a mysterious third that is never mentioned by name, were bought by Mora's father from a German company, refurbished and set out to sea. Oddly enough, the crew think it's weird that there's barely any freight aboard and the cabins are only half full. As we'll find out, that's because we're not on a ship at all, rather a simulation 200 years in the future. At the end of the season, Mora awakens to find herself aboard the Prometheus, not the 1899 version, but a futuristic spaceship housing what appears to be every passenger we met in the simulation. This ship is composed of dozens of pods, which house at least 14 humans each. In Mora's pod, almost every character here received a mysterious letter, which set them on their journey aboard the Kerberos. Morris, for example, was from her brother. He wanted to meet her in New York, where he's found out something nefarious their father did. Morris' brother's name is Kieran, which is odd since it's an Irish name meaning Little Dark One. Not ominous at all. And in episode two, Daniel states that while Mora is an Irish name, she herself is not Irish. It's just an odd thing for the writers to bring up if it weren't important for the story. I actually have a theory that Kieran isn't a person at all, rather an AI set to transfer humanity and only awaken them when they've learned to choose reason over emotion. Remember what Henry said, these humans will continue to die in the simulation because they can't get rid of their emotions. We know from the computer monitor that the Kerberos is on a survival mission. Perhaps Earth was destroyed due to humanity's emotions, something Henry calls man's biggest flaw. Thus, the Prometheus was created to fix this problem, to re-engineer the human mind so that it will always choose reason. Throughout the entire show, the simulation has been a metaphor for the human mind. So maybe that's what this is. It's some kind of imitation of the brain and the different areas are connected to each other. All the areas of the ship, the passengers' memories and asylum, are connected through a series of literal electrical pathways, just like our brains which connect our memories. Daniel can change the code of the simulation, cannot the coding of our brains be changed as well? Mora finds a letter for her on the ship's console which reads, may your coffee kick in before reality does. This is the same message written over and over again on all the nautical books from the bridge. And I bet they'll need some coffee looking at all those weird veins on their faces. My best guess is this is the result of being tied up to these machines for so long. Maybe they were even injected with something. There are also some coordinates, but these are different than the coordinates found in episode one. And I'm not quite sure what these coordinates will do in space. We also get the date, October 19th, 2099, which is exactly 200 years from when Mora awoke in 1899. We do get a message from Kieran stating, welcome to reality, which leads me to my next big topic. What is real? In episode seven, Daniel brings up Plato's allegory of the cave. Picture yourself in a cave and you see shadows dancing on the wall. You believe these shadows to be real. You're seeing them right in front of you, when in reality, something behind you is actually projecting these images. Who is to say that what everyone's experiencing here isn't a projection or simulation? That also begs the question, are the events in space even real? Is this a simulation within a simulation? At this point in time, we just can't be sure. 
sure. In episode 8, Henry tells his daughter that she was fascinated with this allegory as a child. She became obsessed with the idea that our knowledge has no limits, and we can never know if things are how they truly appear. We're in a slumber unaware of the true nature of things, just like our characters are in their own slumber. Mora believes reality is simply neurons flying around in our brain, and that... We'll never know what the stimuli in our brain are caused by a reality or a construct of one. What we do know is that the events in 1899 are not real. They loop over and over again over a period of eight days. If we're to believe Henry, this was a simulation created by Mora so that she could be with her dying son, Elliot. But something to me doesn't really add up here. It all seems pretty convoluted to create all this extra stuff if you just want to be with your son. Henry even goes so far as to refer to the simulation as Mora's dollhouse, and that Mora is God, a creator of this reality. But then it also begs the question, if God is merely the creator of our reality, then who created God? Doesn't it go on endlessly? As we know, the passengers are stuck in a loop. This has gone on dozens of times, each loop taking roughly eight days, and the old simulations archived in a graveyard of ships. We don't know why this loop occurs, but we do know that Henry wants to keep it going and Daniel wants to stop it. Daniel believes the key to stopping the loop lies in Mora. The only problem is that Mora has no memory of her past life. For most of the season, we're led to believe Henry wiped her memory, when in fact it was Mora herself. She was purposely hiding the very key that would get them out of there. But why? Henry believes it's so that she could be with her son. Regardless, Daniel wants to snap them out of this loop and come back to reality. If you notice in the spaceship scene, we never see Daniel or Elliot. Are they awake on that ship? The two of them seem to be rogue actors, free from the normal constraints of the other passengers. In fact, when we see the spaceship scene, there are two already opened pods. One that Mora just came out of, and another by the window. Could this have belonged to Daniel, Elliot, or someone else entirely. After all, Daniel's last words to Mora is that he'll be there when she wakes. Either way, Daniel says the key to overriding the loop is somewhere with Mora. We'll later find it hidden away in her locket. If Mora created this simulation simply to keep people trapped there, then why would she carry with her such an easy way to escape it? It's just further proof that I think Henry is hiding something. Mora's key fits into this small pyramid device. By unlocking it, this simulation resets. This is why Henry so desperately wanted to find Elliot, because because he had it. The device can also manipulate time within the simulation. In episode 5, we see how Elliot uses it to stop his mother from being shot. A larger pyramid also acts as home for Daniel and Mora. Perhaps this is why she chose it as the override device. Henry successfully steals the object from Elliot, but when he uses the key, it doesn't work. That's because Daniel has manipulated the simulation's code so that the key no longer works for that pyramid, rather a new one. And this new pyramid requires a new key, her wedding ring. And a pyramid is also just a great metaphor for secrets as many of the ancient Egyptian pyramids held secret treasure. Throughout the season, we've seen this green beetle which can seemingly unlock any door. If we're in a simulation, consider the beetle a metaphor for a backdoor, able to get into places others can't. In episode 8, we learn of its origin. Elliot found one and wants to keep it, but his mother says it probably wouldn't want to be trapped in a prison like that. She even says, Sometimes we have to let things go because we can't keep them forever. This doesn't seem like a woman who's keeping prisoners trapped in a simulation. Elliot, however, says, I live with you and Daddy forever. I don't know, I get pretty weird vibes from that. And knowing how the creators of Dark love to play with time travel, I wonder if we'll see a grown-up Elliot. Who knows how long these guys have been in space, and do they age while connected to the machines? If so, have Elliot and Daniel grown old while Mora has stayed the same age? In terms of passengers, we know from episode 8 that they're all here for a reason. Each of them have some sort of emotional trauma that they're running away from. They came on this trip because they made the choice to forget their past. And now they're all stuck in here as well. A few of these passengers, we get to see how these traumas unfolded. However, there are a few exceptions, and I want to talk about those. In the final episode, Ling Yi stumbles upon Oleg's trauma. On the ground, next to a trail of blood, is the same New York postcard he carried around with him. All we really know about Oleg is that he's off to America to see his brother. At least, that's what he says. Ling Yi will see him emerge from some sort of tar or oil vat. If any of you know what that is, please let me know. Maybe he killed someone here. Speaking of murder, we also get a glimpse of 
Ramiro's trauma. In episode 3, we learn that he killed a man and took his clothes, i.e. his priest outfit. That may explain the church in the background. Ramiro's lover, Angel, is somehow involved in this. We'll see Angel's back covered in scars, but we never find out why. My bet is that we'll explore more of these in season 2. The last person I want to cover is Henry. If he is actually Mora's father, he is a man fascinated with understanding the brain. He became obsessed with learning to repair it after his wife's mental health deteriorated, something he blamed his children for. We also know he wants to keep Mora in his simulation forever. I get the sneaking suspicion Henry isn't the main villain here. As Daniel warned Mora, this whole thing is so much bigger than she can imagine. 1899 has yet to be renewed for season 2, but I really hope it gets picked up, because I need answers. If there's something I didn't cover in this video that wasn't explained in the show, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching everyone, be sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... What the hell is going on?